good morning everybody once again and uh, as we discussed in the last class uh, we we'll try to break and identify various subsystems in a uh, hypothetical digital communication system in fact the block diagram that uh, we have started discussing last time is no a the only one possible diagram there are many ways of looking at it this is one of them really somewhat hypothetical in nature the idea is to uh, bring out the essential fu functionalities of the various blocks there and to find the logical connections amongst them so if you remember we were continuing with this particular diagram where we had an information bearing sequence at the input followed by a block two blocks which i broadly called as information processing blocks the first one we leveled after understanding has something to do on the information which it is getting from an information source and we call this as a source coding block and the overall aim was to see that the bit rate reduces after the source coding operation so that the bit rate after source coding rb prime is less than rb the input bit rate okay and then the next block was the channel coding block whose purpose was to take care of or take some preventive action against any possible problems or impairments down the stream which includes the physical channel and which may also include some imperfections or lacks design in some of the modules in the transmitter and receiver we'll have some occasions to discuss about these issues in some more detail this channel coder output should go to a block which we named as a baseband pulse shaping unit the purpose primarily is to generate analog pulse wave forms or pulse streams without compromising the information which is there in the input bit stream which may be binary or maybe non binary as well so some pulse shaped pulse will be generated we will call these pulses as symbols later on and this shaped pulses which are which is which are analog in nature are to be fed to the next block which is the carrier modulator which should also get a carrier frequency we labeled them it as f1 okay usually it is the intermediate carrier fine and these two blocks the baseband pulse setting unit and the carrier modulator together make up what is commonly known as a digital modulator okay so at the output of this carrier modulator block that is at point f we get a carrier modulated intermediate frequency signal if signal okay this is a band pass signal that we agreed last time fine many of the cases depending on the nature of the digital modulation technique this signal is a narrow band pass signal fine and it was your responsibility to think about the subsequent blocks there could be more number of blocks but for the sake of brevity i have indicated only three blocks to highlight three features the next block what should it be conceptually frequency translation yes okay usually we try to carry out much of the operations of signal processing at the low power level okay so any amplification at least to boost the signal in terms of power should be deferred as much as possible okay so the next block logically should be a frequency translator or frequency up converter block <coughs> up converter and frequency up conversion needs another input okay which let me indicate as f l o local oscillator frequency okay which is a high frequency carrier okay the idea is that the intermediate frequency modulated signal uh, the modulated signal at intermediate frequency is simply translated along the frequency axis and is translated to the actual frequency band which has been allocated for the purpose of transmission okay typical value of the intermediate frequency in many systems is 70 megahertz for intermediate frequency f1 okay one popular choice is 70 megahertz 
whereas this local oscillator frequency may be much higher, may be of the order of a few gigahertz even. It depends on the applications and the systems, fine. So at output point G, what can you say about the signal? Is it still a narrow band bandpass signal? Yes, the signal is a narrow band bandpass signal. In fact, uh, the bandwidth is narrower further, okay, in comparison to the center frequency. So the output is a narrow bandpass signal. I am writing BP for bandpass, narrow bandpass signal at point G, okay. This signal is not sufficient for direct transmission, okay. If you consider the power of associated with this signal, the power may be of the order of 0 dBm, sometime something around that. dBm stands for decibel above milliwatt, okay. 1 milliwatt corresponds to 0 dBm, fine. So the overall power associated with the signal is small and what you need for transmission of a signal is a high power signal, okay. So this signal is to be taken to the next block and the next block, the major function should be amplification of the signal in terms of power really, okay. So let me call this as a power amplifier. There are several other issues which have to be controlled uh, in between really, that's not very important for the time being. So the signal is boosted in power, okay, and at H, the signal is still a narrow bandpass signal, but this time much stronger in terms of power really, okay. <coughs> now let me ask you the question, can this output power be connected to any kind of load or one has to worry about a very important basic theorem which you learned in <coughs> networks class, power transfer theorem, which says that yes, impedance matching has to be done, otherwise you are not going to, you may have amplified the signal in power but the signal that will go out of this antenna will be much lower compared to the power which was generated within the amplifier, okay, which results because of technically mismatch between the output impedance of the power amplifier and the load that which is the next stage really, okay. And if you just think a little bit, what happens in this, in such situation when the power amplifier is generating say 10 watt, but is actually able to deliver 1 watt. A simple question if I ask is where goes this 9 watt, remaining 9 watt? It gets dissipated in an undesired form within the power amplifier. And what is the resultant if it is allowed to continue? And then the power amplifier gets damaged, okay. Power amplifier gets damaged if this impedance matching is not taken care of properly, fine. And incidentally this power amplifier block may turn out to be, again depending on application, a very costly item in this whole chain of transmitter. So one has to take special precaution and impedance matching is a very important issue in this stage. The signal is very high frequency signal, is a high frequency radio signal we can say. So the matching issue is very clear there and has to be crit critical and one has to pay proper attention to that. We are not going to take up these issues in our course anyway. So the signal is a high power signal. So the next block, if I have to name qualitatively, I will say is a matching unit, okay, matching unit which comes in between the physical antenna, antenna also will be modeled in terms of some input impedance, etc., which will try to match the antenna which is the actual desired load with the output stage of the power amplifier and hence let me allow, uh, let me, uh, sorry, let me name it as AMU as antenna matching unit. The purpose is to ensure the maximum amount of power that is generated, I mean uh, obtained within the power amplifier is transferred to the antenna or the transmitting point, okay. So what is transmitted ultimately is a narrow bandpass signal boosted in power okay, through a very directed antenna with some gain, etc. so that the transmitted signal goes further and is detected even at a very far off point, okay, with sufficient strength. Is that okay? Any question here? Yeah. Right. Right, right, okay. That used to be the technique in earlier days of radio development, but subsequently it has been found that using an intermediate stage helps in the design 
it also helps in quick changing or modification upgradation of the system design okay and it is also easier to implement there are instances of direct up conversion kind of radio still okay but predominantly so far as transmitter design is concerned this two level approach of using an intermediate frequency and an higher oscillator frequency this is very popular okay when it comes to the receiver design just let me comment of late a technique known as direct conversion receiver is gaining popularity but the purpose there is somewhat different if you do not want to compromise with the quality of transmission and the quality of the reproduced signal perhaps this two frequency approach is a better one okay so the signal is now transmitted and we know in between the transmitter and the receiver there is a channel okay for this example hypothetical example of an wireless transmission reception scheme what comes in between the transmitter and receiver is is a channel okay but how can i visualize it i mean can i uh, specify some feature of this channel the channel if you remember is something in between the transmitter and receiver and you should also remember that i, I indicated the word channel must be understood very clearly as clearly as possible we have to understand because otherwise i can't design the receiver in the best possible manner unless i understand what my channel is and what are its features okay so between the antenna transmitting antenna output and the receiving antenna input what is there in a wireless system air right okay we can say that it's as if a free space in between the transmitting and receiving antenna okay when in free space there is no air as such really and air usually comes with certain problems of dust okay certain problems of moisture and things like that okay if we neglect those effects then we can say that the signal <coughs> travels directly okay loses some strength because of power getting dissipated in many directions and only a portion of the transmitted signal is received or intercepted by the receiving antenna okay and during this flow the received signal strength decreases the amount of decrease is very much dependent on the distance and other issues these are some of the issues which are discussed in more detail in subjects like propagation antennas and propagation etc uh, we will occasionally perhaps quote about some figure figures not in much detail our point of interest is to try to characterize the channel and name different possible channels that one can think of okay now usually for a point to point wireless communications okay this intermediate space can be viewed as something very close to a free space channel okay with additional attenuation or signal strength decrease because of dust particles okay with additional attenuation because of signal absorption by water vapor and things like that okay but a very important point here is that this kind of channel usually does not add significant amount of noise during this process of transmission do you agree no because you have read about noise a little bit okay and you also know that the noise usually can be modeled in the form of thermal noise or awgl okay tell me i mean what exactly is the cause or is a possible cause of noise when the signal travels between the from the transmitting antenna to the receiving antenna there are various forms of uh, disturbances like lightnings like interference like right pardon industrial okay yeah then uh, interference isn't it then uh, industrial okay and cosmic also okay anything else but as i understand this noise or the thermal noise is ever present it is always present now we can see that lightning 
is a very occasional phenomenon. Okay, fine. It it is not present always. Similarly, this interference. I mean, what do you feel? It's present always, or I mean, it has to be present. It may or may not be. Okay, we'll talk about interference a little bit more later, really. So lightning, we, I, I can say it's occasional, isn't it? Then it may lead to interference. If both the systems are operating for all the time, really, then interference may be continuous. Okay, so interference may be continuous. Yeah. Pardon? Now, in b when I said there is it's a free space like channel, where from reflection can come, you have to tell me. So, interference, we'll uh, get back to interference sometime later, really. But interference <coughs> need not be continuous, or it may be continuous, it may be interpreter, intermittent as well. Okay. What about industrial noise? <coughs> Always present. Always. Maybe, okay. But still, it may be intermittent also, okay. And cosmic noise? Always, Always. Always present, okay. Now, is it that uh, all these effects or something more, if they are really, they have to affect the signal uh, which is transmitted at any frequency? Lightning will affect at any frequency. Interestingly, lightning does not affect very high frequency transmission. Okay, it affects relatively low frequency signals. See, you can perhaps visualize lightning as a very a high energy short duration pulse. Okay, go for its Fourier transformation, you will find that it flattens out over a higher frequency band. Okay, usually the effect of lightning beyond a few megahertz of frequency is negligibly small. So, it does not matter. If we are talking about the transmission frequency of hundreds of megahertz or even a few gigahertz, okay. So, for our discussion, usually, and when you think of transmitting at a lower frequency, okay, for a particular application, maybe you are not talking of a very narrow band transmission. So, for the conventional purposes of transmission, narrow band uh, signal transmission, at a higher frequency of a few hundreds of few tens or hundreds of megahertz, this lightning is not an issue. It is negligible usually, but lightning is an issue in the overall system design. If you have constructed some receiving antenna and some electrical <laughs> supply is given to the corresponding uh, radio unit, etc., you have to worry about the damage, possible damage of the battery bank and other charger, etc., from lightning. Those are other issues. Okay. During transmission, the signal is not much affected. Interference, well, one has to worry about the signal, about the interference component, which falls within the band in which the signal, modulated signal is transmitted. So, there may be interference at lower frequency, there may be interference at higher frequency. What is very important for us to understand is, I mean when it comes to design, is the effective amount of interference which goes along with that transmission band over which the signal, modulated signal is passing. Okay. So, interference, what we will talk about later on is the in-band interference component. What is important is in band interference during transmission. One has to model, one has to uh, quantify and, and take appropriate action. Industrial noise, industrial noise is usually present, okay, and the noise sources are usually some rotating machines, fine, motors and other devices, and uh, that will uh, spark which may occur in between, and this may result again some kind of occasional noises from the individual events of spark, etc., fine. Again, for a rotating machine, the speed of rotation is not that high really, which will give a very high harmonics, which will interfere with the signal, which is uh, traveling at several tens or hundreds of megahertz or even few gigahertz of signal. So, industrial noise, yes, it does matter if the noise source is in the vicinity of the receiver. The point is that at the receiver end, the signal strength is going to be very small because the signal has traveled a great distance. So, if you have a very strong industrial I mean, uh, machine running and creating this kind of noise in the vicinity of the receiver antenna, receiving antenna, okay, then one has to worry about that. Okay. One very common source of this kind of noise is, again, an impulsive noise is the ignition which uh, takes place when you start your vehicle. Okay. That ignition sometimes creates problems, especially if you are 
carrying your uh, some portable radio devices and you are starting your engine, that may create some problem. But for mobile system, that is also safeguarded by some other techniques. So yes, it may matter depending on its location. Cosmic noise is present, okay, is random in nature, fine, but this effect also need not be prominent, okay, because much of this effect is, I mean, nicely safeguarded by the ionospheric layer really, okay, and only when the cosmic noise is very prominent, you may have a residual effect, especially when you are transmitting between two ground stations, you are not looking towards the sky. However, for some wireless communication systems such as a satellite communication system where the satellite is high above the sky really, okay, above the ground and your receiving antenna will be looking towards the sky, it may get affected by cosmic noise occasionally, okay, to an appreciable uh, uh, extent and this part is taken care, to be taken care of, um, is to be taken care of when you are designing a satellite receiver scheme, a system and things like that, but otherwise it may not be a major issue. But in this list we have so far left that omnipresent issue of thermal noise, where is that? So to understand it very clearly, usually there is no reason why there should be a constant, I mean uh, omnipresent thermal noise source in this wireless channel, which let me call now as a wireless propagation channel, okay. In this wireless propagation or physical channel, so as if I am trying to name the space in between a transmitting and receiving antenna, let me call this as a propagation channel. In this propagation channel, sometimes it is also called as physical channel, physical channel. Propagation channel sometimes includes both the transmitting and receiving antenna, but let us not do that. Let us call this space between the transmitting and receiving antenna as a propagation channel or physical channel. There is really no reason why a thermal noise source should be there in the physical channel. Okay, but when it comes to noise analysis, usually we start with a noise model which is uh, a close approximate of a thermal noise source and things like that. That's primarily because, as I mean, he has rightly pointed out, there is indeed a source of thermal noise not in the physical channel, but somewhere in the front end RF amplifier in the receiver. When I when you talk about the receiver, we'll identify this as a block. It's a very crucial block in the design of a receiver. And it, uh, one uh, popular name for that amplifier is low noise amplifier or LNA, okay. This front end amplifier <coughs> is the major culprit and because it's an electronic amplifier, it is made up of some passive active components. Each of them in their own merit contributes to the noise, some kind of thermal noise and on the whole, as if the signal gets merged in the background thermal noise, okay. So the major culprit which cannot be avoided fully is in the receiver block, not in the physical channel, at least not in the physical wireless channel, okay. Now before we talk about any wireline channel briefly, let us also complete, I mean have some more designation of the channels really. So from now onwards whenever you talk about channel, each of us will try to be particular about putting an adjective so that we specify the channel we are mentioning, we will try to understand why it is necessary. Now, if I call this intervening space as the propagation channel, okay, and if some of you are designing this antenna system, transmitting and receiving antenna, and you have a plan to test it tomorrow, then you would like to define this propagation channel and you would like to specify the performance of your antenna in terms of how much signal was transmitted against what propagation channel, how much signal was received and what was the power pattern, etc., etc. Okay, so those who are designing only the transmitting receiving antenna, for them it is sufficient and necessary to understand and characterize this propagation channel or physical channel, okay. If some of you are designing those amplifiers in the transmitter, um, up converters, power amplifiers in the transmitter and the corresponding blocks of LNA and certain other down converters in the receiver, for them it may not be necessary to understand each and every detail of these two antenna if you take it that way really, for them if somebody has designed a power amplifier of the transmitter block, 
and has designed the corresponding receiver amplifier in the receiver and he wants to test his system in the same environment then what he can choose to model is not only this propagation channel but a somewhat different kind of channel which comes in between his power amplifier and the receiving low noise amplifier and hence he may like to define another kind of channel which includes the physical channel and the two antenna system. It is only a question of visualization and it is only a question of what you have done, what is your focus in the whole chain really against which we can define an appropriate channel. So if the purpose is to test a power amplifier and the corresponding low noise amplifier in a given environment, I can design, I can define another channel which will include the physical or propagation channel and the two antenna system, okay. And that channel should be given a different name altogether, okay. One choice may be that we call this channel as a radio channel, a radio channel which includes the antenna together really. So propagation channel is one kind of channel directly between the transmitting receiving devices, okay. The second channel which we can talk about is the radio channel. which includes the antenna, okay. I guess many of you, at least I in this course will not talk much about this, I am getting back to the previous uh, diagram, we will not discuss much about this design of power amplifier, we will assume certain desired property that this power amplifier is a linear power amplifier whatever signal is given at its input, it very faithfully amplifies the signal without bringing in any distortion and things like that, okay. And antenna matching unit, yes, it has to be done, let the, let the respective engineer do that really, but our focus if it is on the previous blocks, I may like to model another kind of channel wherein I may say visualize anything between the output of the carrier modulator, say at the IF or even at the RF let it be at the RF level. Anything between the output of the up converter which is the input to the power amplifier and the corresponding portion in the receiver, we will see what that point is later on. The corresponding portion at the receiver may be at the input to the mixer or some down converter, okay. This amplifier, the radio transmitting receiving antenna and the physical channel which means the radio channel and this power amplifier and the corresponding low noise amplifier in the receiver together as another kind of channel. If I have designed a modulator here, then it is not necessary for me <coughs> to get into each and every detail of the subsequent blocks the way it has been designed. For me, it may be sufficient and good to model, that means to characterize mathematically, whatever comes in between my output point, okay and the corresponding output point in the receiver and I can call that as another channel really, okay. The next level of channel that we will define, okay, let us consider that at the output of this IEF stage. In fact, we will also not talk about any up converter, down converter design or their implementation. We will assume that up converter is a very simple frequency translation operation and as if it has been done very nicely though there are problems in the design of up converter in the transmitter and more problem in the design of down converter or mixers in the receiver. One has to take special attention, cares, etc. But we will not be much bothered about that. So for us, usually one approach will be that our output will be the carrier modulated IF signal, okay. And the output from our redefined channel will be given directly to the IF demodulator portion, okay. So whatever comes in between these two points of interest, we will call as a channel really and we will let us call that channel as a modulation channel, modulation channel. I am going to the next diagram. So beyond the radio channel, let us define a third channel which will be of our interest is a modulation channel. As the name implies, this channel is good enough when we are designing the modulator and demodulator. We have designed a digital modulator, digital demodulator and then to test it against the possible problems as if we are visualizing or modeling a modulation channel. So the 
transmitter front end so power amplifier transmitting antenna physical channel receiving antenna receiver low noise amplifier okay bandpass filters will be there and even the down converter or mixers all these are parts of modulator channels modulation channels till the input to the if demodulator okay this is as i say is a question of visualization okay if i can mo model this modulation channel it's good so far as my intention of testing the modulator and demodulator is concerned okay i would like to go one step backward even say and ask you a question following this strategy can we i again get back to the previous diagram to ask you can we even go back to <coughs> this point that is the output of the channel coder as if this is one test point and whatever comes in between that means the digital modulator up converter power amplifier etc physical channel then the corresponding sections in the receiver till i get back to the inverse operation of this coder which we'll call as channel decoder okay till the input to the channel decoder i can also define another channel nobody stops really it's only a question of visualization if i am designing say this channel coder block and the corresponding decoder block okay then for me to test and characterize this channel coder decoder block it is sufficient that i understand the overall mathematical model that comes in between okay there is a please note at this point that for this channel a still broader channel the channel coding output is a digital signal it's an information bearing digital signal so the corresponding input in the channel decoder also is expected in a digital signal okay this channel can be named or is named usually as a discrete channel discrete channel okay and this will be sufficient for our purposes so we define a fourth channel let me put it somewhere here at the bottom as a discrete channel note that the input and output of a discrete channel they are digital signals whereas the input and output of a modulation channel can you say something about their analog waveforms information bearing analog waveforms okay the input and output of the radio channel they are rf obviously analog continuous wave rf bandpass signals is it and that of physical channel high power analog signals is it so one can characterize the input and output signals of a channel sorry so these are some of the channel models uh, which are followed when it comes to the design and analysis of wireless systems coming to well line systems can you think of a connection between a transmitter and receiver where they are connected by some wires can you give me an example of such systems telephones computers yes cable what cable cable tv yeah okay yes you have also heard about some kind of optical fiber links okay so land network LAN network. network yes local area network right local area network LAN yes so there are several examples though in a telephone system the signal between two distant users does not always go through a cable okay though a tv cable uh, service in the present form is primarily a one way service and not a good example of a communication system but things are going to change and we are going to have a both way service you may be knowing about that but in a sense these are all valid examples because in some section at least some cables are used okay now again let us imagine that if the a communication transmitter and a communication receiver they are connected by end to end by a cable 
then uh, that cable I mean manifests in the form of a channel really okay. So if I have to talk about again of different kinds of channels at least we can identify the propagation channel which is the cable itself really okay. Now unlike the wireless situation due, depending on the nature of the cable okay some of the issues of uh, possible interference and noise the way we listed some time back lightning interference industrial noise cosmic noise okay they may also be appli applied to a wire line okay and in addition i mean in difference to the wireless physical physical channel in some cases depending on the manufacturing defect the cable itself may present some amount of noise okay that's one major issue really it depends on the quality of the cable that's being used otherwise that physical cable will also manifest some kind of problems okay it will also accept some kind of interference and there is one common effect in telephone systems especially which is known as cross talk yes because of the design of the telephone systems okay so there will be issues of cross talk and other possible forms of interference in this channel in the physical channel over there okay in our course, we will not go into very detailed uh, discussion on the physical channels and their limitations. Those are again issues for the subsequent uh, um, for advanced level courses. But it is good to know that on some cases, the channel is quite clear. It does not present in thermal noise source, especially for wireless systems. For wireline systems also, it is usually the case, case. But because of some manufacturing defects, there may be occasional sources of thermal noise. Okay. Interference may be present in both the channels really, okay. We will uh, discuss a little bit more about interference later. Now I would like to get back to the remaining portion of our discussion of the transmitter receiver. We have discussed about the transmitter block diagram, one possibility, okay. Let us quickly see the corresponding block di diagrammatic presentation for the receiver section and I hope that you will be able to identify most of the blocks almost instantaneously. Here is a blank diagram. Is it clear that this is the receiving antenna? Okay, and uh, there are a few blocks here. Before you start leveling the various blocks, let us quickly think or imagine about the possible nature of the signal that is expected at this point. What kind of signal is expected? RF, low power, analog, band pass, narrow band, narrow band, okay. So RF, low power, which were there in the physical channel. All the signals around you. Right. Right. Okay, let me complete. So the signal at least is RF in nature, okay, is low power in nature, then it is a analog, analog and it is a narrow band pass, okay. Let me use NBP, okay, to indicate narrow band pass signal, okay. Here is a question, uh, uh, he is suggesting that this receive this signal at the input to the uh, receiving antenna should also contain signals which were transmitted by some other transmitter. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The reason is that yes, if I put a detector at this point of the receiving antenna, I shall pick up any other signal which is there in the air. Okay. But because we have designed our system nicely, we we'll, we have used frequency selective devices and systems really like. The receiving antenna does not receive any si signal at any frequency with the same receive gain. Antenna has a very important parameter of gain <coughs> really, okay. The antenna is so designed that it has a maximum or near maximum gain at the frequency in which this system operates. So it will pick up only those signals which are in the desired frequency band, which means the signal from the desired transmitter. So antenna is a frequency selective device. So main element of design is the length of the antenna. Antenna design again is not a part of this course really, will be taken up as a very, uh, I mean as a part of uh, other courses in the third, in the next semester and uh, after that basically, okay. Yes, there are different kinds of antennas for different applications, okay, fine. Uh, you, please repeat your question. The gain, main design. Very similarly with the 
length of the antenna is fixed. It doesn't no, in fact, roughly speaking, the length of the antenna is related to the frequency of operation. If you are using a lower frequency for transmission, the corresponding wavelength is larger, okay. And uh, as a thumb rule, you may remember that the length of the antenna is proportional to the wavelength, okay. And when I say wavelength, I mean the center frequency of transmission of the bandpass signal, okay. So it is usually related to that. But antennas come in various shapes. It need not be only uh, like a stick, really. It may come in like a disc. It may be in the form of meshes. And antenna design is a, a very interesting and uh, I mean, uh, very interesting and involved topic, really. So for us, it is sufficient to know that the desired signal primarily is picked up here in the receiving antenna, okay. Then what should be the next block? Again, some matching unit, okay. Because you have received a very weak signal. Let us add this feature. The signal is low power or weak in nature. It's a very weak signal. Okay, it's so weak that maybe some of the conventional systems, electronic systems, may not work. May not be able to detect and process that further. Okay, so this antenna on its own should not create much problem. It should simply receive and it should ensure that this whatever signal it has picked up, it goes to the next stage of amplifier. Really. Okay, so let me similarly call this as an antenna matching unit, but this also does a very important job of bandpass filtering. Antenna has a gain profile, okay. Usually along with this comes a tuned or tank circuit. You have heard of, you have studied about tuned amplifier, okay. So if you imagine an input tuned uh, amplifier really, then this may be something like that. So let me simply indicate this as AMU, but this AMU is not identical in design to the transmit AMU. Okay, because the coupling uh, block, the next block, they are different. If you have a filter, the antenna with its impedance and the input stage of the neck of this next block of amplifier, low noise amplifier, will have a frequency selective network, bandpass filter characteristics. Okay. So the signal is very weak. You have a narrow bandpass signal at this input point. Okay. So the next block should be the purpose, signal processing purpose should be to boost it so that we can go for further processing and hence it is LNA. The name suggests that this amplifier should amplify the signal which is very weak. Guess why it is called low noise? Yeah, this amplifier should be so designed that the amplifier on its own does not generate much of noise here. Because if it does, then that noise gets added with the signal which is to be amplified and what we get at the output of this LNA is signal being amplified, okay, getting added with the noise which was generated from here. And this is usually the major culprit in a wireless receiver design mainly which contributes the thermal noise, okay. So at the output of this LNA what we get is moderately amplified signal, okay, moderately amplified bandpass signal. I say moderately amplified because uh, you have designed some amplifiers. You know that if you ask for very high gain from an amplifier, there are associated problems of oscillation and certain things, okay. So by design, this amplifier gain is not high. A typical value is 10 dB, 12 dB kind of thing. It hardly exceeds 20 dB, okay. So this is a, an amplifier where if you are designing this LNA, the focus should be to reduce the background noise, okay. And these LNAs are characterized by certain uh, 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 um, uh, metrics such as noise figure and things like that, okay. So this amplifier should not generate its own noise, but it should amplify the signal to mo a moderate level. That's the purpose. What should be the next block? Another amplifier. Well, uh, each amplifier, if I add several amplifiers in cascade, okay, to boost the signal too much, then it will lead to associated problems of uh, stability and certain other issues really, okay. So what is normally done is that the down conversion operation is carried out here, okay. Down conversion operation can be carried out with a low power signal, okay. So this is a DN I am writing for down, C-O-N-V, 
for converter, down converter. And as can be guessed, it needs an F L O. Let me put F prime L O to indicate that this F L O is something which has to be thought of. It need not be identical to the transmit F L O. Okay. Fine. It will be somewhat close to that. Actually, one has to find out. So it needs a local oscillator output which multiplies uh, the input signal and with some bandpass filtering principle of mixer has been discussed okay it's essentially a mixer nicely designed mixer we get an output from this stage which is weak intermediate frequency signal isn't it weak if signal with some background noise because some amount has noise has crept in from this lna okay so i can talk about some kind of uh, signal power to noise power ratio or some parameter equivalent to that one parameter which is normally expressed i mean uh, taken into consideration for designing the subsequent streams is known as cnr carrier to noise ratio carrier power and the noise power ratio okay so cnr is one parameter of interest which if you want to measure someday you can do at this point it is also possible to measure at the output of lna okay at a higher frequency so cnr is one parameter because now because of this noise source at amplifier okay the carrier to noise ratio power, noise power ratio is not very very high again fine it may be 15 db 20 db something like that what is the next block yes the signal now can be boosted because it's a narrow bandpass signal now and the frequency is at typically at f1 the intermediate frequency and so if let me call it as if amplifier stage <coughs> meaning that there may be multiple stages of amplifiers with many other issues of uh, agc etc etc but the major point is that the signal is weak but it is a narrow bandpass signal now at a comfortable low frequency of f1 which as i said may be at 70 megahertz or 140 megahertz relatively low frequency now the signal should be boosted by bandpass amplifiers here. Okay, it so there been a problem amplifying the signal at higher frequency. <coughs> Sorry, amplifying because signal at higher frequency. design of high frequency, very high frequency. I mean, uh, high frequency amplifier is difficult really because you get more amount of noise. Okay, and there are other issues of bandwidth of the amplifier. Usually, the bandwidth of the low noise amplifier, depending on the application, will be wider then the bandwidth that is necessary for this if amplifier and as you know if the amplifier bandwidth is smaller you can achieve higher gain because there is something called gain bandwidth product which is i mean fairly constant okay so the gain is mostly provided in the if stage the if output is a strong narrow band modulated signal okay the signal is still modulated fine guess quickly the next block <coughs> should it be carrier demodulator good approach okay so loosely let us call this as carrier demodulator fine so carrier demodulator i am writing f1 prime it may be should be very close to f1 should be very close to f1 may not be the same always so carrier demodulator but let me uh, caution you that it may not be possible to identify some of these blocks the way I am trying to explain really. Okay, my intention here is to tell make you aware about the major issues which should be there. Okay, but the correspondence to the physical circuits may not be there all the time really. In fact, we would prefer again to call these two blocks together as the digital demodulator. Digital demodulator. Where the purpose of this next block we will simply call as detector detector this two block combination we will call as digital mod demodulator or receiver also in some sense though digital demodulator is a closer word for these two blocks then complete the last two blocks decoder. channel decoder i am writing ch for channel dec for decoder okay and the last block is the source decoder source decoder okay decoder slash the information sync
sink is a counterpart to source. We had information source, so I indicate the information sink. Before you stop here today, let me just emphasize two points that this diagram is a hypothetical diagram, okay. M major issues we tried to capture, it is not essential that any digital communication systems have to have all these blocks. For example, in any systems, the source coding and decoding operation may not be there, but the initial pre-processing operation from analog to digital, etc., will be there, okay. So there will be variations, channel coding and decoding may not be there in all communication systems, but in many communication systems it will be there, fine. So this is just to give you an example really, fine. In the next day, on the next day we will discuss a little bit about giving an information theoretic approach to this issue of design of digital communication system, wherein we will continue with the discrete channel. We will not talk about this modulation channel, propagation channel for some time, we will talk about the discrete channel, the source coder, source decoder, channel coder, channel decoder and bring in the concepts of quant information in a quantitative form. Thank you very much.